Who is in charge here? I used to be a low-level manager at Florida State at the test center on campus at Florida State. And uh, as a low-level manager, um, you, I had to regularly cover the front desk. So whenever uh, a test proctor had to go over to the computer lab, I would have to kind of man the front desk area. And one day that happened, the, the test proctor had to go take, take someone over to the computer lab. I was covering the front desk. And at that moment, my boss's boss's boss walked in. She was actually the head of the entire department. And uh, there was, uh, so as she walked in, I got a phone call. And so I said hello to her, grabbed the phone. And it was the test proctor who had just gone over to the computer lab. And there was a major catastrophe going on at the computer lab, which was around the corner. You had to exit the front office and go around the corner to, to the computer lab. And so I get off the phone and, and I say, Bonnie was her name. I said, Bonnie, I'm, I am very sorry to ask you this, but can you cover the front desk <laughs> while I go over to the computer lab to deal with this issue? And she said, sure. She was a very gracious woman. She said, no problem, David. That's fine. Happy to cover the front desk. So she sits down behind the desk. I go over to the computer lab and sorting things out, I make it back over to the front offices. And as I walk in, I see that there's a man aggressively approaching the front desk. And he walks up to where Bonnie is seated and he goes onto the front desk and he goes, who is in charge here? And uh, Bonnie said, I am, sir. How, how can I help you today? And um, he said, not you. Who is really in charge here? And uh, he, by that time, he noticed that I was standing behind him. So he turned to me and he goes, hey, you, who's in charge here? And so I just pointed at Bonnie. I said, she, she's in charge here. <laughs> and um, and uh, he just starts letting her have it. This isn't fair. I'm going to sue you. you. What you did to my son is terrible, blah, 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 blah. So it turns out the day before, his son had cheated on a test and had his test canceled and his instructor notified. I just want to point out at this point that this is a college student which means that this son of his was an adult, right? <laughs> and this was his dad coming into our office. And so he's just going off to her, and, and she's kind of listening calmly and, and politely. And then after he's kind of finished with his tirade, she says, you know, it does sound like your son wasn't treated fairly. Usually when these kind of cases happen, we report them to the, uh, to the Office of Student Misconduct. So I'll tell you what, I will personally deliver his name to the Office of Student Misconduct and make sure he gets the appropriate punishment. Well, this really made him mad. And so, <laughs> so he's just going off. And, um, and he said, I demand to speak to your boss. So Bonnie just takes out a little slip of paper and writes down the name and number of the president of Florida State University and slides it across the desk to him. Well, he, he left very quickly after that and said no more. The next day, Bonnie called a meeting with all of the test proctors and me. And I will never forget what she said to us. It was, it was a pretty powerful moment, actually. She said, when you work under my authority, you work with my authority. She said, if you do the right thing, I will always get your back and I have the ear of the president. If you hear nothing else I say in this sermon, I want you to hear this. When you work under Jesus' authority, you work with his authority, and he has the ear of God the Father. As Christians, we believe that Jesus has given us his authority, and, and he has access, direct access to the Father. And the reason we believe this is because Jesus has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Every week in the Nicene Creed, we say that we believe this. We say that we believe that Jesus ascended to, the, to heaven and that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. But the ascension of Jesus seems a bit bizarre, like Jesus is some sort of rocket ship blasting off into space or something. And, and it's hard to see how does this event connect to our lives today. And I think this basic Christian belief has gone largely unexamined in the church 
Maybe you have wondered yourself, why does the ascension matter for today? Why is it important that Jesus ascended into heaven? And so this morning, I want to just briefly highlight three implications of Jesus' ascension. The ascension of Jesus gives us access, gives us authority, and gives us a call to action. So first, the ascension of Jesus means that we have access. I didn't have access to the president of FSU. You're probably surprised to find that out. But I, I couldn't just call him up on the phone. But Bonnie did. Bonnie had access. And through her, I was given access to the president. The same is true for us as Christians. Before Jesus, we were separated from God by sin. Sin created this sort of cosmic interference between humanity on earth and God in heaven. But now, after the ascension, a human being is in heaven. Humanity has entered into heaven. At the core of our Christian faith is the belief that Jesus has opened a way for humanity into the very heart of heaven. I love the way Oswald Chambers puts this. He says, by his ascension, our Lord entered heaven, keeping the door open for humanity. There is now freedom of access for anyone straight to the very throne of God because of the ascension of the Son of Man. Because Jesus is in heaven, we know that at every time, at all times, there is someone listening to our prayers who, who knows us and understands us, who knows what it is to be human intimately and personally. He knows what it's like to have a bad day. He knows what it's like to see a loved one die. He knows what it's like to go to school and to work a job. He knows what it's like to be looked down upon and, and treated like garbage. He knows what it's like to face suffering and death. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet was without sin. So the first thing that we learn about the ascension for us is that it means that we have special access. A human is hearing us when we pray. A sympathetic ear. Hebrews 7.25 says, Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Jesus not only hears our prayers, he takes our requests before the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's like right there, very intimately and close, so that he can just whisper into the Father's ear for us. He's whispering all of our prayers into the ears of the Father. We have access to the Father through the Son. And this means that we have access to the highest possible authority, the greatest power in the universe. Our reading from Ephesians 1 says this, God seated him, that's Jesus, God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. There is nothing that is not under the authority of Jesus. Everything is under the authority of Jesus. There's lots of people rebelling against that authority. There's, there's lots of demonic spirits rebelling against that authority, but Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. In Jesus, humanity is once again reigning and ruling over creation. But, this is a big but, this is so critical. It's not just that we have access to the one who has all authority, but that the one who has all authority gives us his authority, his power. So second, the ascension of Jesus means that we now have authority. This is from our reading from Acts 1. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. At, at the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus returns back to the very first thing that he proclaimed at the start of his ministry. The thing that John the Baptist said about him. What, what did John the Baptist say about Jesus? He says, I'm baptizing you with water. 
But there is one who is coming, who is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, John said what he was preparing the way for, the central goal of Jesus' ministry was to baptize people with Holy Spirit and fire. And so Jesus returns to that and he reminds them, this is what John the Baptist was preparing for. The Holy Spirit's no longer going to be reserved for specific people at specific times in a specific place. Now it's going to be poured out on all of God's people. You know, I think we have a, a heavy emphasis, and rightly so, on the cross and resurrection, on, on the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. I, I think it's right that we focus on that. But I think sometimes we forget why Jesus came why he died on the cross, why he rose again. Jesus lived, died, rose again, and ascended to heaven to send us the Holy Spirit so that we could become his presence on the earth, God's holy, empowered people. He says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This was the founding mission of Jesus, was reconciling us back to God so that we could be filled with his power and bring his presence all over the earth, wherever we go. God's people are called to exercise his authority over creation. We are the means through which Jesus is reigning and ruling today. He, does, he exercises his authority through us. The same authority that Jesus had to cast out demons, forgive sins, heal the sick, that same authority is living inside you if you believe. We are agents of God's authority on the earth. That's our call. That's our mission. So third, the access and authority that we have is a call to action. We've been given this, all of this access and authority for a reason, to act on it, to put it into practice. You know, the disciples were astonished at Jesus' ascension. After he disappears into the sky, there's this really funny scene where all the disciples are just kind of doing this. What do we do now? (laughs) Where did he go? (laughs) And I I don't know what they were thinking in that moment, um, but let me read it to you. See, see, maybe you can come up with what you think they were thinking. Acts, Acts 1, 10 and 11. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. You know, even though they've been told explicitly what to do by Jesus, like a moment before he ascended, they still were just standing there kind of stunned. They needed the angels to kind of snap them out of it. But I I think, I think part of what they were thinking about was, well, who's in charge now? Is he going to reappear? Was this like a momentary thing? Is he going to come back? And that's what the angels seem to be addressing. But the disciples weren't called to be spectators, just standing around waiting for Jesus to come back. They they were called to be witnesses. That's why God sent those two angels to kind of snap them out of it and say, remember what the mission is. Remember what Jesus just said to you. Go and do that to redirect them, to remind them of their call to action. I played trombone in middle school, middle school and high school, and I was, I was in concert band, jazz band, marching band. I was, I was the epitome of a band nerd. So in case you couldn't tell I was a nerd, now you know. And there was um, one concert that we were doing, and it was at an outdoor amphitheater, very similar to the amphitheater we have. It was just gorgeous, it was perfect weather, you know, which in South Florida is amazing. It wasn't blazing hot, but it was gorgeous weather. We were outside, and we were were playing this piece that I'd really fallen in love with. Um, And so it was one of those songs, uh, it was a song by Brahms that just kind of slowly builds, you know, and there's different instrumentation that gets added in slowly as it builds. And it was this beautiful day, and I'm sitting outside, and my part didn't come in until about midway into the piece. And so I was just taking in all of this incredible music that was being played. And, you know, for once, you know, the clarinets sounded good. My, my wife played clarinet. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> I was riding on clarinets there a little bit. But for once, the clarinets just sounded perfect. The saxophones were good. The oboe was in, on tune, you know, in tune, amazingly. 
trumpet and French horn came in, and it was just, it was just perfect. Everybody was just playing at their absolute best. And then I heard the trombones come in, and the trombone is, is my favorite instrument, and they sounded wonderful. And out of nowhere, while I'm enjoying this beautiful music, my buddy punches me in the arm. And I look at him, I'm like, why are you distracting me from enjoying this beautiful music? What is wrong with you? And then I saw him with the slide of his trombone pointing to our music stand that we were sharing. And I realized I was supposed to be playing. <laughs> I was a trombonist. <laughs> I had completely missed my cue. I was supposed to be playing my instrument not just listening. I was acting like a spectator instead of playing my part. Many of us have missed our cue. We have been so busy enjoying the music of life that we've forgotten that we have a part to play. Jesus hasn't called us to be spectators. When Jesus says that we are going to be his witnesses, he doesn't mean that we're just going to be sitting around watching stuff happen. That isn't the kind of witnessing he's talking about. The whole reason Jesus sent the Holy Spirit was so that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How you witness might be different than the way the apostles witnessed. We each have different parts to play. But when we play them together with the authority of Christ, it is beautiful. What I'm trying to say is that you have a purpose. You have a destiny. You have something you are put on this earth to do. And not just one thing, many things. Many things. God has prepared many good works for you to walk in. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Why? He answers, because I am going to the Father. I am going to the Father. So you're going to do greater works than what I did. The ascension of Jesus was so that we could do those greater works. The body of Christ is no longer in one place at one time. That's how it was when Jesus was walking on the earth, right? The body of Christ was his physical body, and it was only in one place at one time. But now, the body of Christ is in many places at the same time, all over the face of the earth. Look again at the end of our reading from Ephesians. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And listen to what it says about the church. This is fascinating. Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Think about that for a second. What Paul is saying there is that it is through the church that God is filling the earth with his presence. The fullness of him who fills all in all. The church, the body of Christ. And when that body is activated, spread out over all of his creation, watch out. There is nothing the church can't do. We each have a part to play. You have an intimate, personal part to play. Not everyone can make beautiful music, but some of you can. Not everyone can disciple children, but some of you can. Not everyone can have the faith to pray for healing and miracles, but some of you can. Not everyone can be a, a winsome evangelist, but some of you can. Not, not everyone can build beautiful furnishings. But some of you can. Not everyone can cook and serve. But some of you can. Not everyone can give to the poor. But some of you can. We each have a part to play. Next week is Pentecost. That's seven days from now. The disciples had to wait a little bit longer. They had to wait 10 days because Jesus ascended on a Thursday. So we get, we get three days less that we have to wait. I want you to take the next seven days to pray and really seek the Lord. Let's seek the Lord together. The disciples locked themselves in the upper room 
They went out occasionally to the temple, but they mostly just stayed in the upper room, praying and waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, day and night. You'll be relieved to know I'm not going to lock all of you in a room together while we pray. I think we've had enough lockdowns in the past year. We don't need any more time locked down. But as we come out of a long season of being locked down and shut down, I feel like we're right on the cusp of something really great. God is going to release us into new and powerful ministry. What part do you have to play? I want to encourage you. We've got these. Um, we're going to hang. Oh, I lost mine already. Look at that. We, after the service, uh, Bill's laughing at me because he, he gave it to me before the service and I, I knew I was going to lose it. Anyways, um, we have these little booklets that we're going to use for next Sunday for our ministry fair. And it lists all the ministries of our church. I want you to take that home. The ushers will look at this. He's a rock star. Thanks, Bill. Not all of us can hand out bulletins, but some of us can. I want you to take this home and really pray over it and say, Lord, what ministry are you calling me to? It might mean that you're going to be called to step away from a ministry you're currently doing so you can step into this new ministry. That's okay. It might be even that as you pray over this, you say, there's something missing. There's a ministry that our church is called to that we need to add on here that I'm called to do, that I'm called to bring. Awesome. That's wonderful. Don't let this limit you but also let this be a starting point. Pray over this over the next seven days and say, Lord, where do you want me to minister? Am, am I called to, to go to Rose City Estates and minister to the children there? Am, am I called to disciple youth in our church? Am I, am I called to disciple children? Am I called to you know, um, help out with the Alpha Course? There's, there's so many ways, and you have a part to play. Pray over this. What ministry is God calling you into? Is Jesus in charge of your life? Well, then he has something for you to do. You can't do everything, but you can sure do something. Maybe many somethings. As the world reopens and life starts to go back to normal, don't just drift through your life as a distracted spectator. I know it's tempting to want to just go back to normal, to go back to the way things were. It's comforting. It feels like coming home. But then what was this past year really for? If not to interrupt our normal and call us into a new, extraordinary life. Jesus has ascended to the highest authority to give us access to the Father and authority in everything. Who is in charge here? Only you can answer that. I encourage you, answer that question with your life. Say, Jesus is in charge here. Jesus is in charge of my life. Jesus died to give you new and abundant life so that you would go and live it. Amen.